So this talk is um, <clears throat> about how at Wanila, which is a company I work at, uh, we were um, lucky enough to be invited into beta program for Joint Manta, uh, which is an object store I'm going to talk about, and how we solved um, a relatively uh, complex problem of collecting enormous amounts of data um, about behavioral um, actions that our users um, do, such as saving products, clicking, and so on, um, and uh, how we were able to, um, on top of that, uh, run various uh, relatively complex analysis, such as, uh, oh, beautiful, um, such as cohort retention analysis and um, various other things. So um, before I start, um, I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about what Vanilla is, the company I work for. Uh, vanilla is a consumer product. Um, it's basically a, it's pronounced Vanilla. It um, comes from want, need, love. And it's a global platform for uh, all of the world shopping. This is um, a screenshot. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a beard oil um, on my list of products. Uh, everyone needs beard oil. I recommend you get it. <clears throat> so how Vanilla works? Users find products um, on the various online shopping sites. Um, they post products to Vanilla via bookmarklet. Other people discover these products um, on Vanilla, and then they save them to their collection on Vanilla. Um, oops, all of that. Um, so this is an um, example on the website. You basically see here is a product image. You can uh, click on the Save button. You can see that it already has 9,000 saves. 9,000 people save this product. It's popular. Um, this is sort of how it works. Vanilla is a social network um, in addition to a uh, product catalog. And um, users can follow other users. They can follow stores. Um, they can follow um, also uh, collections and hashtags. Um, and um, result is a personalized um, product feed. It's not uh, just uh, kind of a global, this is what's popular trending. It's also what you prefer, depending on who you follow. And um, after seeing a product on Vanilla, one way or the other, people can click on buy and go um, and actually uh, buy the product on the Target website. Uh, really briefly, uh, we are very um, mobile centric. We have mobile um, apps on Android and iOS. Uh, we have all, over 60,000 ratings. Um, as you can see, they're mostly five stars, um, which we're pretty proud of. People love the app. And uh, since it's a tech talk, uh, really briefly, this is what our backend stack and key vendors looks like. Um, we are running our site on um, MRI Ruby 2.0 and Rails. Um, we are on top of Postgres, Solar, Redis, Memcache, all of these um, awesome open source projects. We are running on Join Cloud. We love SmartOS, um, ZFS, Rcache, all of the um, uh, goodies that come with it. Um, we are um, obviously using Joint Manta, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Um, we are automating the entire infrastructure with Chef. Um, we're using Fastly um, as our main CDN, um, and currently it's uh, in front of Amazon S3, uh, but that's something that we're also planning on uh, migrating to Manta um, sometime soon. Um, and for um, uh, tracking, uh, monitoring, and um, uh, trending, we're using Circonus, uh, New Relic, StudsD, and Boundary. So final word about Vanilla, we love cats. Um, and we also love having fun. So um, let's talk about recording user events. So recording user events, um, what does it look like? So let's say user saves a product. Um, we create a row in our database to, um, to solidify that this uh, relationship has happened. But we also want to record this event as just kind of an append-only thing that this happened for future analysis. In the ideal world, this append-only table um, basically has every user-generated uh, event that we have. Whatever you do on a site, ideally we want to record so we can later analyze what do people do after they do this or before they do this and so on. Um, well, what's the scale here? How much data are we talking about? Well, at Monila we have currently about 8 million users. We got about 6 million products. Um, they were saved over 1 billion times. We have about 200,000 stores. Um, anytime you post a product from a different store, we create that store if you don't already have it. Um, and our backend application peaks at about 200,000 RPM, so requests per minute, uh, which is around 3,000 requests per second, which for rail side is actually quite a good traffic. And we're generating about 5 and 20 million events per day. Um, so um, that's a lot of data. So when we started, we, we, we didn't really have a lot of traffic. So 
what we did, we were just like, well, traffic is pretty slow. Let's do something stupid. Let's create a database table and just start writing these events into it, right? That makes sense. Um, well, is it scalable? Definitely not. After one month, um, we launched our traffic. Wasn't even that high, but that approach no longer worked. Um, so we decided to scale data collection. We were like, we're not really analyzing it yet. Yeah, database table is awesome. We can run all kinds of queries, but we're not really doing it yet because we're just like building the product. Let's just make sure we can collect this data first. So we rewrote this. Um, inserting 10 million records into Postgres is relatively stupid. Um, we've looked at various other options that exist out there. Um, Flume, FluentD, uh, Scribe. Didn't really like any of them. Too complex, lots of uh, moving parts. We wanted something really, really simple. And we chose rcslog. We're like, let's just create an rcslog server. We're going to send some data to it. Um, we have more than one uh, log collector for redundancy. And the clients can buffer all these packets, which is really important um, in case there's a network um, latency or anything like that. So it's a relatively reliable way to, um, to send the data. Um, <clears throat> and uh, RCSLog actually is a really, really reliable software. It works really well. We haven't had any problems with it for a year. Um, and now we are sending almost 20 million events per day uh, across 40 uh, hosts. All of them are sending the data. RCSLog just writes it to a file. Um, so the file is actually a pipe delimited ASCII file. It's super simple. Um, and we also use Logatom to rotate whatever we dump it, rotate daily, and we get one and a half sometimes two gigabyte file per day activity. So at this point, we we'll solve data collection problem. We're now collecting this data. We have it, pushing each file to NFS somewhere. Later, we can figure something out with it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, if you need big data, we have it. So now what? <clears throat> so we have hundreds of files closing in on 500 gigs, uh, almost terabyte um, at this point. Um, and we want to ask some intelligent questions. What types of questions do we want to ask? Well, for example, um, how many people um, who sign up, you know, four weeks ago are still active on the site? Or, you know, co which, which is something that we would call cohort retention. So cohort would be the people who sign up four weeks ago, and are they still being active and engaged on the site? Um, how many products, um, this is another big question, how many products does a user need to say on the site in order to become engaged later? Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you know, but Twitter had done this research a while back. Um, I think they discovered that if you follow something like can't remember the exact number. I think it's 15 users or 19 users. If you follow 19 users, you're very likely to stay engaged on Twitter forever. And they found this this, this is a number that they're now pushing. So all of the Twitter messaging, all of the Twitter um, um, essentially engagement program is all about getting you to follow this many people so that you can stay on Twitter. So getting to this number is really, really key. It's really important. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Um, so let's look at what our log file looks like. Um, hopefully you can see this. It's a really, really basic thing. It's a pipe delimited, um, essentially, table written as an ASCII file. The first column is a user ID. The second column is a platform, whether it's coming from iPad, Android, iPhone, um, desktop, uh, would be website. Um, the, second, the third column is action, um, what, they, what they actually did. Did they save a product? Um, did they start a new session? Um, the types of action record the registrations, um, uh, product unsaves, follows, and so on. Um, as I was writing it, I was like, why do we have the word action in every single one of them? But that's just something else. Um, so then um, there's object, what object you saved, what type of object, um, for example, if the save action applies to, object ID, and then sometimes there's a secondary object, such as which collection you saved it to, and its ID. And the last column is a, uh, just a basic epoch timestamp. Um, any questions so far? Great. So um, parsing ASCII files is that simple. We all know how to do this. There was a question? What's the, sorry, I, would, I can't hear the question. If you're writing up log lines like that, you have your own, what is your facility for getting logs into that format? Oh, um, so what we're doing, we wrote a tiny little um, a wrapper in Ruby around sending UDP packets. So we're just sending UDP packets to rsyslog, which are, uh, and it's basically that string. And rsyslog just writes the whole thing as is. You, you wrote that, uh, that's what I'm saying. Yes, so yes. It, I mean, it, it's literally four lines of Ruby code. It's really, really simple. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so parsing um, ASCII files is really, really simple. 
um, we can use you know unique tools like you know grab sort unique uh, compare awk wc and so on and these unique tools have been optimized for a very very long time um, four decades really and um, you know my challenge to you is to write a faster grab uh, it's really really fast I'll talk about how fast it is and <laughs> Have you brushed up on your awk skills? Because we're going to look at some awk scripts in a minute. Let's ask some questions. How many unique users uh, followed um, someone or something on the iPad platform on a particular date? How do we do this? So we can cat the file. Um, and um, some of these scripts actually can be optimized and condensed and collapsed. Uh, grab has a minus C option that counts lines. I know you know all this. Um, this is just for readability. Uh, we may not be doing it in the most compact possible way, but it works. So we're cutting the file that we're collecting, um, then we're writing a tiny awk script um, where basically we're saying, hey, um, we're using the pipe as a delimiter, um, and the script itself basically says, if the second column here is an iPad, and the third column says follow action, we're going to print the uh, first column. And the first column is just a user ID. So super, super simple. Um, awk script, and then what we're doing, we're sorting all these user IDs, um, we're uniquing them so we only have a unique list, and then we're counting number of them. Really, really simple. So now we know how many people followed anyone, anything on iPad on that date. Uh, what about user registration? How many total registrations happen across all platforms on a particular day? That's even simpler um, because all we have to do is to grab for the register action. Um, and um, the dash, dash F um, and dash E, you know, we actually can skip those things. Um, Grab will work without them as well. But you can look it up on the main page. Um, so how fast does this actually work? Um, so we have 1.5 gigabyte file. It actually takes about 10 seconds to parse that thing. This is amazing. This is really, really fast. Um, this is an example. We actually, here we're not only uh, parsing it, we're actually unzipping it on the fly. Um, and then parsing it, and then counting it, and the whole thing is 10 seconds. That's pretty, pretty badass. So can we, can we go back a whole year now? So what we have now is these files that are um, basically representing one day of data, and we have lots of them. We have you know, close to over 300 now because we've been doing it for a while. So on one hand, we know how to do it. We just did it with one file. Um, but on the other hand, if we multiply this by 360 files, we suddenly get to hours. Ours is not good. Ours, we're getting into the whole area of the data warehouse thing. <laughs> Run the query, come back the next day. We don't really like that. So um, this is where the, prop, the, the concept of MapReduce comes in. And MapReduce is the um, um, computing model that was published by Google in 2004. Um, it describes a way to paralyze a bunch of jobs. Um, um, it applies to certain types of algorithms, not all of them. But uh, you can basically do um, really interesting computations across huge data sets. Um, and this is sort of really roughly how it works. You have the map phase, you have reduce phase, you have, you, 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 you're working with the um, key value hashes essentially, and you have to uh, map everything into key value hashes, um, which is in, in some ways is actually kind of a bit of a, um, um, a bit of a limitation, I think, of this algorithm. You have to think about these terms, you have to figure out how to map this into keys and values. It makes it a little bit harder. Um, so we have lots of really um, uh, good projects around uh, MapReduce today. Hadoop, HDFS, Spark, Hive, Pig, we're watching all of them. Um, some of our engineers had had experience with them before and they've done it. Um, and decidedly, MapReduce requires a new way of thinking, um, which means also it requires learning, learning something new, learning new tools, figuring out how to use them. Um, and so one of the questions um, that you have to ask yourself when you're building a Hadoop cluster or something like a Hadoop cluster is when you want to be uh, on demand or permanent. So um, it's, a, it's an infrastructure lifecycle question. Uh, you, if you create an on-demand cluster, um, um, then um, you basically have to copy lots and lots of data um, to that cluster in order to run your queries. And that takes time, right? Um, but, but the advantage is that it's a cheap solution because once you run your queries, you can kill the cluster, it's dead, and you're no longer paying for it. Um, if you have a static Hadoop cluster or permanent, um, you're basically continually uh, running Hadoop. You can run queries ad hoc any given time. It's available to you. But the biggest issue is cost. Um, it's expensive to keep around a large Hadoop cluster that sits on top of a copy of your data, especially if you have terabytes of data. 
Um, and so here, um, this is where we're going to talk about Jones Manta and how Manta addresses some of these issues. So what is Manta? Manta is object store. It's a distributed object store, somewhat like S3, but with different semantics. It has Unix-like file, Unix -like file semantics, um, which is really, really nice, especially because it has directories, and listing directories is really nice. Um, it's been one of the things that um, has really been pissing me off about S3 for a very long time. Um, it has, it's strongly consistent um, instead of eventual consistency like S3. Um, so either your write succeeds and you get a success result, um, in which case it's actually written, or you get a failure, in which case you can retry it yourself as a developer. And as a developer, I prefer that. I would rather have that than, 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 than send something to S3 and then have it appear at some time point later. And then maybe our users who are browsing these products are not actually seeing the image that we've uploaded for some time because of the eventual consistency. Um, and then Manta also has a native compute on top of object, and that's where it really is different um, uh, from S3. Um, so there's going to be another um, uh, talk about Manta. Um, uh, Mark um, uh, and uh, Dave Pacheco are going to be talking about scaling the Unix philosophy in big data, uh, I think tomorrow at 10 a.m., correct? So I encourage you guys to see this. So um, now what we can do is we can dump these user event files into the Manta. Instead of saving them to an NFS, um, we're just pushing them as objects. And one object becomes one file, it's one day of events. Obviously, if you want higher uh, resolution, you can split them up. You can do this every hour. You can do this even more frequently. Uh, for us, one day works really well. So let's look at an example. Uploading and downloading, what does it look like? What does it look like creating directories and pushing stuff to Manta? Um, so we can create a directory um, uh, which, with this command, mmkdr. I'm not going to go into a setup of Mant and how you set up all of this. This is all available in the documentation. It's really easy to do. Um, but once you have it set up, you have your own um, kind of object store uh, namespace. Um, and so this is how we would put, uh, we would upload a file that we have uh, onto Manta and call it this particular object, and it's going to live in a user actions directory. Um, um, so then this is how we would get that and uh, dump it back into uh, a file. Um, when we do mget, I believe it just uh, uh, dumps it into standard output. Um, there may be other ways to, to do, maybe declare a file that it uh, goes to, but you can just redirect. Um, you, ca you can uh, list directories. Um, so this is how we can see what objects we actually have there. Um, very convenient. Um, and so now, um, what makes uh, Manta unique on top of storing these objects and listing them and working with them is the fact that we can actually run compute jobs on top of them. Um, so we submit a compute jobs to Manta. Manta creates many, many virtual instances um, um, almost instantaneously. Um, and they're, they're, they're very close. They're, they're really on top of uh, the data. Um, and we even get root access on these little zones, little virtual machines that, we, uh, that Manta creates for us. Um, and the reason we get that is because these zones immediately deleted as soon as the job is done. Um, so, so there's no damage done. Whatever you can do with this, it's up to you. And so what we can, we can do now is we can parse these objects in parallel, these uh, event objects, the, the, the logs that we are pushing to Manta. Um, we can do this in parallel. So how does map, uh, Manta's MapReduce works um, just conceptually. Um, so what it does, it streams objects into the initial phase. So you have these objects, you say, these are the objects that I want to work on. Um, this is the script. Pipe these objects into the script. Um, and all of that happens in parallel, so that's a streaming. Um, and then um, the output of that um, phase um, goes either into another phase that's similar um, to, to that, and it's, uh, I think it's one-to-one. -one. Um, or um, it could go into uh, many-to-one. It could basically then um, co co condense all of the outputs into a single reduced phase, um, which is where um, um, you would potentially get your final result. Um, in this phase, in, in this way, it's a little bit different, I think, than um, um, traditional map reduce because you can have many, many uh, map phases. Um, um, but, uh, but I believe they have to be one-to-one. -one. Is, that, is, that is that accurate? Right. Right. So, so this is um, this is how basically we would to take input objects. We'd do some map phase. We'd do something with them. We could we could pass them to another um, set of maps. Um, continue doing this if we wanted to, uh, or or we can write a single script that does it in a single map phase, and then eventually we do a reduce phase, which um, combines all the outputs together. And, and it's a very familiar uh, paradigm because it's very similar to piping things um, on the Unix file system. So a um, real example, uh, let's ask a more computational expensive question. How many times a store was followed in the last three months? So now we're actually talking about 
looking at many, many files, potentially 90 files. Oh, this is going to be hard. So um, what are we going to do? So first of all, we have 90 objects that we're going to look at. And we're going to, um, I'm not going to show how to do this, but you can actually, uh, um, you can actually submit a job and you specify which objects you want to run it to. So we're going to specify the last 90 days of objects that we want to run this to and provide this script. Um, as, um, as our map phase. And so what this does is it will grab each um, log file, each object uh, for follow action. Then it'll also grab it for store. And the reason is that you can follow stores or users or other things. And so what we want to do is only um, those lines um, that represent following a store. And that's what we're going to get. And so we grab it twice. Um, and then we calculate how many lines there is. And now we get a number of follows of a store per day from each map phase. So what is a reduce phase? Well, reduce phase just needs to sum up all these numbers. That's all we want. And that's a really, really simple awk script. You basically get the variable defined, incremented, at the end you print it, done. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about a um, slightly more complex um, example here. Um, so in this example, uh, we're going to do cohort retention analysis, which is something that um, uh, was very important to us early on. Uh, how many um, people who have joined a certain amount of um, time before are still on the system, are still active, engaged users? And we want to do this potentially for users who signed up four weeks ago or um, three months ago or nine months ago. So depending on what cohort we define, we still want to figure out what those um, attrition levels are. Um, any company that um, you know is, a, as a, is essentially building a consumer-driven site would be really, really interested in these numbers. And these numbers are actually pretty hard to get if you're running a typical Hadoop cluster. Those are not complex queries to do. Um, so how would we do this? Uh, the difference between this case and the previous case is we're actually going to need to do two sets of uh, MapReduce jobs. Um, and, and we have to connect them somehow. And the way you connect them is by uh, creating a temporary object that contains your results. Um, and once the object is also in Manta, you can then write a totally separate MapReduce, MapReduce job that then um, also parses our log files, but also uses the result of a previous job. So we're going to merge, which essentially we're going to have those two MapReduce jobs uh, work together. So um, this is what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to save the objects. We're going to um, define a cohort as a set of unique users sharing a particular property. In this case, um, we're going to define them as uh, people who sign up uh, more than um, basically in a week. Uh, I believe it's a week, week four uh, back, so between 21 and 28 days. So what we would do is our set of objects we're going to run on is going to be seven uh, log files um, that were created between 21 and 28 days ago. Um, so map phase um, only runs on the seven days of the given week, and all it does, um, and it's a really simple, again, um, awk script, um, all it does is it grabs for uh, the register action, uh, which would be the column number three, and then prints column number one, which is, again, a user ID. Um, and this is our um, uh, map phase. And then map results sa save, um, um, and then what it does is it save, uh, reduce results, uh, takes all of these um, user IDs and saves it into a temporary object, and this is how we would do this. Um, so first we would sort, we actually could probably do some of that sorting and uniquing um, in the previous action um, in the map phase, but uh, in this here we are sorting, uniquing, and then emptying it, um, which, is, um, which is the Manta uh, construct, which allows us to take the output of this and put it in the Manta temporary object. So now the unique IDs of, so the unique users um, that registered for seven days uh, between 21 and 28 days ago, all of their IDs are now stored in this object. Is that clear? It's really, really simple. So all we now need to do is um, um, we need to uh, intersect, essentially, uh, that list of unique users with a list of users that are still active. So we're, we're running another uh, map phase that runs just the last seven days of files this week, um, which is basically just printing the users. And then reduce phase uh, simply intersects um, the, the previous um, object with, uh, with the one that's generated here. And this is a little bit more, more complicated uh, command here. So what are we doing here? We're sorting them. We are uniquing all of the outputs, um, dumping them into the uh, period unique IDs. So these are the uh, last week's users that signed up. And then we're using this command called com. So, um, does anyone not know about com? Um, so um, 
most people know about COM, but COM basically compares two files and writes three columns. Um, one is uh, unique things in the first file, unique things in the second file, and then um, the intersection. And I think what we're doing here is we're subtracting column one and two. We don't care about those. We just wanted the intersection of the two. So um, the, the one file that we're looking at is this one, and we're intersecting it with, um, sorry, this one here, and we're intersecting it with the one that was previously stored by a previous job. And after that, we're simply counting lines. So now we know exactly how many users are still on the system, the one that signed up four weeks ago. Um, so um, I went a little bit fast, so I'm actually approaching the end of my presentation. Um, but uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is um, kind of other uses of Manta at Vanilla and how we're also planning on um, in, um, taking advantage of this um, distributed object store. One of the things we're doing today is we're pushing all of our user images for all of our products onto S3. That's what most people do. Um, we, because we have close to six million products and we're creating close to, I think, six or seven different thumbnails. Um, so that's 36 million um, images that we're hosting on uh, Amazon S3. Um, well, quite often um, as new phones come out or as new uh, designs come out on our website, we actually would like to have a different thumbnail size. Sometimes it's a high resolution, sometimes it's a square, sometimes it's something else. Or it could even be a different image format. Um, recently Google announced the WebP format, which uh, offers, uh, I think, 30% reduction of size compared to JPEG, which for a company like Vanilla, which is extremely image heavy, um, is a huge deal. Because uh, on a mobile, uh, for example, if, if, if your load times are 35% lower, um, your experience is that much faster, so it's a big deal. So we want, to, so we may want to create WebP uh, image files for all six million images, and maybe multiple formats, maybe six WebP files. So how would we do this uh, now uh, with S3? Uh, the standard way to do this would be to write a giant migration that goes through all of our products, downloads every single image from S3, probably the original ones. We don't need the thumbnails. Create the new uh, thumbnails or the new formats, uploads them back up. Yes, we can parallelize it. Yes, we can write, you know, hey, let's split it, modular 10, any product that's, you know, one and so on, we're gonna do in one thread or one process and we can run 10 of them. It'll make it a little bit faster, but we have to do it all manually. Um, S3 will probably throttle us anyway. So there's, there's, there's a lot of moving parts there and it's not very fun and that's not very convenient and it's gonna take days, if not weeks. And so if we migrated user images to Manta, um, and if we serve them from Manta directly, which you can do because Manta also has a public, domain, public um, namespace, not just a private namespace. Um, so if you serve them from a public namespace, obviously you would want to have a CDN in front of it just like you would with S3. Um, but then uh, the difference would be that we wouldn't need to download anything to our, um, our um, servers in order to create new images. We could just run a job that creates these image formats uh, across all of the uh, nodes at the same time. Um, and and um, what's interesting, um, actually, um, what's interesting about this um, is um, that the, the virtual machines that join starts uh, for you on top of uh, these objects actually already has a lot of these tools. Um, not only has basic Unix tools like grep, uh, sed, and so on, it also has um, convert and image magic and all of these tools that are required to actually produce different image sizes. Um, in fact, it even had the tool to convert the new image uh, format to WebP, which uh, you know we didn't even know that it existed until recently. Um, um, the, the virtual machines also have other things like um, uh, Ruby, Python, R, uh, statistical package, and uh, many, many other things. And I believe there are probably others being added to it as well. Uh, you can also download something and compile real quick um, if, if it's not already there and then run it. Um, we haven't really um, needed to do that yet, but um, it certainly is a possibility. So um, to, to, to wrap this up, um, you know, creating different image formats uh, on Manta would be a really, really simple task. And it would probably cost us, I don't know, $300 of <laughs> compute power, just do it, bump, and done. And um, I don't know how long it would take, but I can imagine it would take much less than a few weeks. Um, one other thing we do with Manta is we push backups. Uh, our database backups we push to Manta. Um, Manta storage is actually really, really competitively priced. Um, so um, it actually ends up being um, cheaper, uh, faster, and more reliable for us to do that than using uh, like an NFS storage. So if we, need to, um, um, if we need to create a database from a backup, we just download it from Manta. 
Um, we're also using, um, if you're using Postgres, you may have heard of a thing called Wally, which basically does things like upload these archive logs to, um, to uh, S3. Um, it's something that may or may not be needed with 9.3 because 9.3, they did a lot of uh, work on um, making replication a lot easier. But um, um, I, don't, I don't think Wally supports Samantha uh, out of the box yet, but that's something that uh, would pr probably be relatively easy to do and just start pushing all our catalogs uh, to Manta. We're already doing this, but we're not using Wally. We're just doing it ourselves. Um, so um, that's sort of um, the, um, the, that's really the talk. Um, so my conclusion is here, we were able to create a very cost-effective solution for um, a data collection and storing massive, massive amounts of data. Uh, I'm not worried about scaling it 10x, 100x, a log we have multiple log writers, they will, they will be able to catch up. It's really not that hard. Um, and Manta allows us to perform really complex operations and algebraic, essentially, queries um, that, that I would probably have to scratch my head around how to do this in Hadoop or Hive or Pig. Um, but Unix command is very, very familiar. I've done this for 20 years. Um, really, really, really excited about being able to do this. And so it's really cheap as well. And so now we have all this money. What to do with it? Um, and we're just all scratching the surface. Manta just got released. Um, I think there's many, many opportunities for using it. Um, I think it's uh, the time will only tell uh, what you guys will come up uh, with and uh, how will you end up using it. And um, we will probably ourselves find many, many other users besides the three I mentioned. That's pretty much all I have. Any questions? Tens of millions of inputs. Um, no, we haven't, um, not yet. But um, what's interesting here is that with these little scripts, you can kind of figure out like where is the computation happening. Um, like for example, um, in that example that I gave about cohort retention, um, we could, instead of calculating the number um, of um, users in each job in the map phase, we could simply output those users, right? But then the reduce phase would have to do a lot more work because it would have to combine all of those inputs together. And so um, a lot of the times when you're starting to do this, you need to think about like what, because reduce phase may happen um, in a single machine that has to combine all the results, um, it's probably best not to push too much output to it. So as much as you can collapse your input in the map phase, which happens in parallel, the faster your job will run. Um, but yeah, we our scale had been so far uh, only on essentially close to a terabyte of data and close to maybe 300 uh, objects, but uh, not definitely not tens of millions. So, so your image simulation is more um, it's, it's planned. It is not theoretical, but it is planned. It is just not something that we have done yet. Uh, I'll be really curious to see how fast Manta converts them. It's a really interesting test. <laughs> Any more questions? Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Oh, one, one quick thing. Um, this uh, technical blog here, buildingvanilla.com, has a relatively detailed uh, copy, or not copy, but relatively detailed post about um, all of the stuff that I talked today. Um, and also, we have a bunch of uh, open source projects um, that are available on the GitHub. Um, the Vanilla, Vanilla Chef. If you're enjoying cloud or if you're exploring enjoying cloud, there's a lot of really useful goodies there uh, that will help you get up and running quickly. That's all. Thank you.